Good morning and welcome to our Sabbath School panel. We're so happy you can join us this Sabbath morning as we study God's Word. But before we begin, let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the privilege of studying your Word this Sabbath morning. Please come and be in our midst with your Holy Spirit. Guide us and teach us from your Holy Word. Give us your strength and wisdom that we can Follow the lessons you want us to learn and help us to apply them in our lives. Bless all the listeners who are here today, far and near, and help us all to have a rich blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today, we will continue our study uh, from the lessons of the book of Acts. This week's lesson is entitled, Boldness Bestowed. Today on our panel, we have Sister Barbara Montrose, Brother Livio Tudoroi, and myself, Lillian Ballback. If you would like to study along with us, you can find a digital copy of the Sabbath School lesson by visiting sdarm.org forward slash publications. You can also find it in the Apple App Store and the Google Store by searching SDARM. Right now we're going to begin studying the review lesson real and selfishness, and this will be taken by Sister Barbara. So, as you recall, we had spoken last week about real unselfishness. Now, why is it called real? Well, because there's a fake version too. And sometimes people like to put a big show that they're so unselfish, but it's not always the case, right? And the attitude that the, um, that the apostle bids us to have, he says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, Philippians 2, 4. So what does that mean? Not only consider what's convenient, what I need, but also thinking about others also. And the, uh, the lesson brought out last week, when those who profess the name of Christ shall practice the principles of the golden rule, the same power will attend the gospel as in apostolic times. And we want that apostolic power, don't we? We want, we want to have the, the power of the Holy Spirit being poured out in abundant measure. And I was impressed last week as we were thinking, if we're not getting that power the way it's promised, then it might be because we're not practicing the golden rule and its principles as, as we should be. So that's something for us to think about. So the lesson brought out a little bit about divinely inspired charity. And it talked about, we were reading from in Acts chapter four, about the sincere charity of the early Christian church. Um, I wonder if, if you can help us with that, Sister Lillian, a little bit. Uh, Acts chapter four, at least verses 34 and 35. Those two verses say it very well. So basically in those days, many believers were added to the church. They came from different nationalities, different economic backgrounds. And as they accepted the new faith, many of them were disowned by their families. So they had nowhere to live, maybe they didn't have a job, they didn't have food. And so there was necessity at this time for everyone to contribute. The people were selling their lands, they were selling their properties, and putting all the money into a huge fund that was meeting the needs of these new believers. And people were doing this very, very generously from a heart full of love. And it was so good here that it said that there was not anyone who lacked anything. And they sacrificed cheerfully to meet the emergency. It was not a grudging thing. So it was really an example for us of true liberality, true love for our brethren. Exactly, thank you for that. And, and that's the real key. There was a real need, it wasn't just throwing money in the air, saying, well, I don't need this, whatever. But there were people that really needed something. So they were willing to say, okay, this is mine, but it's not mine, it's, it's needed. It's, mm -hmm. It really belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And so it, it mentions in the Bible, neither was among many of them that lacked, and as many as were possessors of lands or houses, if they had things, they sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as, as he had need. So, uh, the reason for this is that their love for the brethren and the cause they espoused was greater than their love for mon money and possessions. And I wanted to, again, it's because this kind of thing is often 
twisted and misunderstood in, in, in the last days. Um, we need to understand, for example, and we read this last time, but I wanted to read it again, Christ Object Lessons 247, it says, the Lord does not require the hardworking man to support others in idleness. Mm -hmm. With many, there's a waste of time, a lack of effort, which brings to poverty and want. If these faults are not corrected by those who indulge them, all that might be done in their behalf would be like putting a treasure into a bag with holes. Mm -hmm. So that's a very serious warning, isn't it? You don't just give something because somebody says they want it. Yet there is an unavoidable poverty, and we are to manifest tenderness and compassion toward those who, un who are unfortunate. We should treat others just as we ourselves in like circumstances would wish to be treated. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, that's the key. We need to have discernment, and then as we have the Holy Spirit, we will have more and more discernment in these things. It's the true. next, Can yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's true, these days, you know, there are many people who are just waiting for handouts. Yeah. And they're not willing to work. You know, they have opportunities to get a job, they're not willing to do that, and they're just expecting others to provide for them. So we have to be wise to help those who truly need it, who are diligent, and encourage them to work. Exactly, and, and we ourselves have to be among those that, Jesus says, six days shalt thou labor, exactly. and do all the work, and, and uh, it says, if a man shall not work, he won't eat. Mm -hmm. You know, so all these things are important. So they had this love for one another in the early church, and they were willing to lay down their lives for the brethren. And um, it <clears throat> mentioned that money, time, influence, all the gifts they had received from God were viewed as a means of advancing the work of the gospel. And this is something that should be our priority in these days. Um, we need to be willing to make sacrifices in order that others can hear the gospel. So one of the examples of people that had... Um, had given generously for the work of, of the gospel was a man named Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which being interpreted the son of consolation. He was a Levite in the country of Cyprus. And he had land, he had some extra land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, Later on, we see in the book of Acts some more about Barnabas, and he's a very inspiring individual because he was very missionary-minded. Mm -hmm. And so he just, he saw the need, he was happy to do, he said, hey, I got this piece of land and I'll just donate it for this, for this distribution to be made, as you were mentioning. And his, heart, uh, his motives were pure, his heart was sincere in that. And then we saw another case that maybe wasn't quite as much from the heart. But nobody would have seen this from the, out, from the outset. Um, and what happened? It mentions a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Okay, they sold it. Now, they had thought about this a little bit, and they were impressed because they saw this happening. They saw the progress that was be made, made, being made as people would donate. And... So they said, hey, let's do this. Well, now there's a very serious point here for us to remember. Sometimes people will go to an altar call. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll go to a, a sermon where there's an altar call made and they'll go to the front and they'll say, I wanna take my stand for the Lord. And then they think about it afterwards and say, well, I need to count the cost of this because if I if I really do all the things that this church teaches and it's really in the Bible, I've seen it in the Bible. But um, if I do all those things, then uh, this and this, you know, consequences, uh, you know, things might be not so convenient, not so easy for us. So what happens then? The Holy Spirit is grieved, right? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is grieved because we have to do things by faith when we feel impressed by the Holy Spirit. So they were impressed to sell a piece of land, just like Barnabas had done and some of the others. Mm -hmm. But then what happened? Mm -hmm. uh, feelings of covetousness came in and they yeah. had regret, you know, when they realized how much money was involved and you have the money in your hands, you've actually sold the property mm -hmm. and you think, wow, I think we really made a mistake, you know. So they thought we were too rushed in our decision, let's just give part of the money, we'll keep some to ourselves, and then we can still go to the general fund where everybody's collecting, 
and we can get some extra for ourselves. So they committed, made it two or three sins, right, one after the other. Exactly. After they had chosen to sin against the Holy Spirit. It's a very serious thing. Not only do we make one mistake, but you have to lie and you have to cheat so you can cover yourself for the first mistake. Yeah, it just doesn't work. It gets, like you say, it goes down a slippery yeah. slope. And the big problem was not just to have a little more cash in the pocket. I mean, yeah, you sell, sell a piece of land for $10,000. And then they think, well, maybe I was being a little extreme. That's what the person all of a sudden thinks. But in this case, it wasn't just cash in the pocket. It wasn't just a little bit more money. The real thing is that it says they saw that those who parted with their possessions to supply the needs of the poorer brethren were held in high esteem among the believers. Oh, it's prestigious to do this. Mm-hmm. Oh, so then they came out, figured out this way to get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, so we will, this is simple, we'll just fix it. We'll say that the property was sold for $5,000. And then they'll still think, oh, Ananias and Sapphira are so generous generous, and they're so unselfish. And let's promote them and give them this position because after all, they've done so much for the work of God. Well, so they decided to sell the property, pretend to give all the proceeds to the general fund, but really keep a large share for themselves. And it says they would thus secure their living from the common store and at the same time gain the high esteem of their brethren. Mm-hmm. What a what a sneaky yeah. thing here. Sister Rory, it's interesting uh, that when you sell a property, usually as a believer, you entrust the price on the hands of the Lord. Yeah. Correct? Mm-hmm. So, well, the scripture doesn't speak about the price. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. A, it's a, what was a consistent value, correct? Yeah. But now, let's say, uh, when they set the price, did they ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want us to ask for in, uh, in exchange for this property? So I do really believe that the value was inspired by the Lord. Mm-hmm. Transaction, the transaction per se, was uh, guided by the Lord because they got a big, big money, chunk of money. So I do believe that everything that happened up to that very point was providential. Selling the property in a yeah. record time, yeah. the highest value uh, possible, and all of a sudden, when they see that the miracle happens, they try to to take advantage of God's intervention mm-hmm. that was designed for His church. So basically, when they say, "Wow, we couldn't believe that we asked for one million dollar dollars for this property, and he sold with one million dollar. So God really made a miracle. So how about if we uh, it, it, it's too much anyway. The value will be five hundred thousand. We can take a little bit off. we We can leave our we don't need retirement. And you know, we can go to church with the open uh, chest we we did something for something the lord great. yes so i i do believe that they tried to hijack the miracle that was meant for the church to their personal interest sure. yeah and it it gives a a little warning here in the uh, lesson it says of a shallow motivated motivation that we all need to be aware mm. of and what was that it was it um it was mentioned in the gospel of john twelve forty three. They loved what? The praise of men more than the praise of God. Exactly. And so that was motivating them to try to be prestigious in the eyes of the brethren. Is that pleasing to God? Because nobody knew. Nobody knew except God. Mm -hmm. But God impressed Peter to have a little chat with, with them. So he asked them how much the property was sold for. And they said, yes, so much. And then he asked the wife and... And uh, she said the same thing. And what happened to both of them? They were killed. Instantly. Mm -hmm. Instantly. I mean, it's like the proverbial lightning bolt. Yeah. Just Now, why was it? I mean, we mentioned here that that you said God loves a cheerful giver. We shouldn't be grudging about it. They were grudging about it. But does this happen today? Probably does, where people do this kind of thing. They want to be showing off and... And they will, you know, make something appear as it's not in order to make themselves look prestigious. What was the difference here? Why did God just not tolerate that? I think it was a warning signal for um, the rest of the people not to repeat the same mistake. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's a warning. It's written here in Scripture. Till the end of time, people are aware of it. Mm -hmm. And 
you know how you have to be very careful of a baby. Mm -hmm. We're careful how we hold the baby. We're careful how we feed the baby. We're very meticulous, very meticulous yeah. about babies and young children in particular because they're so vulnerable and they're so impressionable. And here God had a baby church. Mm -hmm. He had a young church. And just think, if this kind of attitude were creeping in from the beginning, mm -hmm. um, think of the problems that would exalt what would happen. You see, Sister Barbara, there are... Um, there are a lot of people, and I think it's a trend, it's a mentality in the Christian world that the God of Old Testament uh, was a bad God and the God of New Testament is a good God. The God of the Old Testament was a God without grace and the God of the New Testament is a God with grace. So that's why uh, you have in time in Protestant world, at a time when uh, you will have just the Bible uh, called the New Testament and the Book of Psalms and you will not have the Old Testament because they will not reconcile, they could not manage to reconcile the, 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 the God of, New, of the New Testament with the God of the Old Testament. Like a similar instance, you have a death in the, uh, in the time of the person that uh, went to uh, uh, cut wood in the Sabbath, yeah. you know, right. and you have a few instances that are extremely rare. We don't even know how many times in the Old Testament would have happened that a rebellious child should be stoned mm -hmm. based on the law. How many times a person that went to pick up uh, wood in the, in the Sabbath would be stoned. However, there are few um, unique instances mm -hmm. which shows that God had to set the stage this is a real business. Don't do that again. Exactly. And the rest of the people have feared the Lord and obeyed. So as you have those few particular or peculiar instances in the Old Testament, you have this unique because the biblical report, it does not show that God kept doing the same thing. On right, and on. Right. It was once for all, right. and God has spoken. That is on the report of the uh, uh, recorded on the biblical uh, pages. So everybody knows that God is not uh, uh, is taking serious the the plan of salvation and the working with uh, with humans. Exactly. Thank you. And it's so important because uh, the statement was made pu publicly mm -hmm. by the apostle Peter. Um, he asked the question, he said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? So does that mean we can never sell a piece of land and, and keep part of it and For give ourselves. part of it? That doesn't necessarily mean that because he said, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? It's not the problem that he decided to keep some. The problem was he was lying about it mm -hmm. and trying to make himself look good. It says, why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And so that brings um, the next, the, the final section of the lesson, which talks about a minimum that God requires of us. Um, we have the warning in Malachi. It says, wherein are, is... Um, God robbed often in what? In our tithes and offerings. Yes. I yes. think when we look back at the Israelites, they were giving 25% of their income. And some places I've even seen 33% of their income was given in tithes and offerings. Mm -hmm. They were very, very generous and God blessed them tremendously. And I think sometimes we, <laughs> we don't give as much or, or, or maybe not as cheerfully as we should. And I think, because yeah. God will bless us. Whatever we give, He will bless. He says, I'm going to pour out the blessing from heaven that there won't be room to receive it. Exactly. And I think we've all experienced at times when we gave a little bit more than we were expecting to, something amazing Heaven, would yeah. happen afterwards. And it's the Lord was it kind is. of affirming that. That's right. Now the tithe is very important because it's actually not given to God. It's returned to God. It's his it's definitely his part. All of it's his, really. All of it is. But, but the tithe he specially has reserved. And the offerings are called free will offerings because that's a test of our heart. How freely are we going to give? We want to receive freely from him. How important it is that we, that we give freely, too. But the other thing that it brings out, and I think this is important, um, is our attitude 
And I think we should read the, uh, the verse in um, Matthew. It's not in the lesson, but it's another verse that's very pertinent to this. Matthew 6, 1 to 4. The Lord says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy life, left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be seen in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself may reward thee openly. So this is the lesson we learn from this that Ananias and Sapphira, they were eager to be seen, they were eager to have a high position and uh, to be um, praised by people. No, this is not going to get us anywhere in, in, in the kingdom of heaven. Um, it mentions also that the point about vows mm -hmm. and Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. the verse that we read there, it talks about if you're going to make a vow, even if you, it seems like at the moment, it seemed perhaps, as in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, they felt it like it was maybe a little bit hasty. What do we have to remember about that vow still? You have to keep it and you can't change your mind. Exactly. It's, I mean, because it's a promise to God any less binding than a promise to man. That's right. We, you know, like I mentioned, I think last week, we, we promised we're going to pay our mortgage payments on our house. And we don't think of skipping that. If we do, we have to pay a late fee, right? Yeah. And any kind of other statement to the bank or anyone, we never think of, you know, I'm not going to do it this month or I'm not going to pay. And this why? This is a very serious yeah. thing and we, we stick with it and we do it. Because we're sort of, um, that bank seems so big and important. That's right. And that bank has the power to take the house away if we don't pay it. That's right. Well, who has the power to even give us a house and give us life and everything right. else? God is much bigger than that bank. That's right. And so if we're going to respect that bank, which we should because we gave our word that we were going to pay it back, then how much more should we, should we um, remember the Lord and remember how important these things are? So the lesson brought out that we're warned if we withdraw, um, part, withhold part of the price um, we can sometimes be pretending to come up to the rules of tithing, and, and the Lord is not pleased with that. We don't want to lose time doing that. And the Lord has come, uh, clearly manifested a certain abhorrence to this kind of sin, and those who give themselves up to hypocrisy and covetous may be sh sure they're destroying their own souls. So it's good that we finished that part. We get to talk about something more positive now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly uh, what, is, what is very important for us as a conclusion is that when we promise something yes. to people or to God, mm -hmm. we should be consistent with our yeah. statement. Yeah. In Jeremiah 34, 16, uh, you know, the Lord had a problem with the people of Israel in regard to taking uh, slaves from their brothers and sisters enslaving their own brothers and sisters. And then the Lord intervened through his uh, prophets and those that were um, um, learned in the law. And it says it's not supposed that we should take our brothers and sisters in, in, in slavery, in bondage. And, and the Lord says, but then you will draw your statement. You, will, you, you change your uh, attitude and you dishonor me before the entire nations around. So I think it's a pretty ugly situation when we when we promise something to the Lord and and then change our minds. It shows, it shows how much respect we have towards this entity that is called Jesus and our Heavenly Father. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Barbara. Now we're going to move on to the lesson of the day: boldness bestowed. We will ask Pastor Livio to take over. Yes, good morning, uh, brothers and sisters, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great privilege to study the Word of God again, uh, continuing our journey in the life of the disciples, the life of those uh, apostles, 
in our lives as well, the life of Christians that really, really profess to follow Jesus. Definitely a boldness bestowed. Uh, it is a very, very interesting and non-conventional title for today. So I do really believe that uh, we will have a good time, especially having Sister Barbara and uh, Sister Lily together. And all of you, even though we don't hear your comments, we do really believe uh, that uh, you can uh, you can help us in that respect. So now as we proceed, uh, memory text. Uh, Sister Lily, would you be so kind to introduce the key text of our uh, subject and Sister Barbara, the, the note from the Spirit of Prophecy. And daily in the temple in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Let the people understand that you have a message that means life, eternal life, to them if they accept it. If any subject should enthuse the soul, it is the proclamation of the last message of mercy to a perishing world. Ah, it's interesting. So uh, we are not uh, Methodist because we don't try to do evangelism by promising the people the burning flames of the inferno, yeah. you know. So there were times in the history of, of, of Christianity where fear factor was a, a major uh, trigger for so-called conversion of, of, of humanity. Mm -hmm. But looks like um, the message that we have as a last generation, it's a message of hope, a message uh, in which mercy appeals to the heart mm -hmm. of the individuals without trying to persuade or inflict fear as a major element of decision. Because oftentimes we take decisions based on fear and you can notice that when fear disappears, uh, we go back to square one. But when love is the factor that persuades, overwhelms, touches, melts our hearts, then when love and mercy work and they are truly operators in this laboratory of, of, of our mind, I think that uh, the conversion, the repentance, the change of character will be consistent and will be, will be uh, stable. You will not uh, have a Christian that today proclaims one thing and tomorrow proclaims something else. So praise the Lord that we do still have to present before the world a Heavenly Father uh, that is full of mercy, pity, and compassion for humanity, even though we cannot depossess God of his right of being a judge and bringing justice uh, upon the world that rejects his mercy. But first, God is love. And then, in the same proportion, God is just. So let us go on Sunday to proceed in our subjects uh, all on the altar. Uh, this lesson continues on the, um, on the connection or the, the chain, the link of the last lesson with Ananias and Sapphira. And that's why the first question is still uh, uh, triggering the, the, the dwelling upon Ananias and Sapphira situation. How did the judgment upon Ananias and Sapphira affect the, the believers? Uh, Obviously, there was an impact, correct? Right. When, when God intervened in such a bold manner. Actually, I would say that this type of death is very similar with uh, Uzzah. Yes? Uzzah? Yeah, that kind of thing. A very sudden, uh, no time for the second thought. Uh, wow, it, it is amazing. And that really terrified, even though we talk about the church of love, correct? We, you, we, we were in the first century and first love was there as we will see in the disciples amongst the uh, in the life of the church in the life of the disciples and yet beside love that was uh, prevalent amongst the christian members of the first church or early church you see this thunder woof all of a sudden intervention of god in the church of love yeah so oftentimes we have this nostalgic uh, uh, i would say uh irrealistic imagination about, oh, we should be like the church, uh, like the early church, when love was all over. Well, love was all over, and yet you have a case of Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> right. So you talk about the church that has love, but you don't talk about the absolute 100% perfection. Yeah. Because these people were members of the church and they were donating. How many people we, do, we have today that donate to church uh, to have a say in the decisions of tomorrow? 
you know, there are members that have financial establishment and they will say, well, I will make a, a, a good, consistent donation if somehow, brother, do you think that we can change this resolution or that mm -hmm. resolution or make uh, may shift this decision for the church? Like, I don't like the parking lot here. I like the parking lot here. If I give $50,000, do you think that I have a say? In that, so even today we do have this type of behavior. Uh, people that are wealthy, established, they would like to give money with the condition to be a little bit the gurus behind the curtain. And even though they are not seen in the front uh, page of the newspaper, they would like to influence the destiny and the direction of the church based on how much they give and how much they not give. So here is a warning. I, I try to be as realistic as possible because that's why we learn Yeah, and lessons. that's bribery, really. That's it, it, a form it, it, of bribery. It is, it is a form of, and, and we see that in the political arena in the 21st century. You know, governments are bribed, uh, b -b 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 institutions are bribed. And, and you know, this is the first step because when you bribe an authority, then you lose that authority by default. Yeah. So you bribe a government and that government loses its power. And then you become a puppet institution. And then when you lose your influence and you lose your power, you will be basically persecuted. Because you, you, yeah. will, you are used and then you are removed. But coming back to our point, because we talk about uh, what, what should be, uh, what, what, what should each of us consider regarding uh, properties today. What was happening with the disciples? What was the impact of the death of Ananias and Sapphira? What was the flavor, the talk of the town amongst the disciples? Well, there was great fear mm -hmm. because this story, even though this happened, I guess, in Jerusalem, this story was repeated in all the cities in Judea. So people were very, very afraid um, and very cautious when mm -hmm. they were making promises. But the note brings this to our time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we, we're going to have to decide what to do with our property very Correct. soon. And the danger is that we hold on it to our property too long, you know, waiting for things to happen. And uh, when it may be later too late, when the Sunday law is passed and we're not able to sell our property. So it gives us a few steps. Number one, we should lay our property on the altar right now. Mm -hmm. Don't wait till then. Say, Lord, everything I own and have is yours. And then we should ask earnestly, Lord, what do you want me to do? And when do you want me to do? You know, when is the time for me to sell and get rid of this property so we can use that money to spread the gospel? And it says, if we do that, he will show us exactly what to do. If we don't, we will keep our property and it's going to be too late. Like some of the people in 1844 who did not follow that, you know, when they wanted to give their property, it was too late and they, they were very, very sorry, but the Lord couldn't use their money anymore. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that we are living in a Christian society or culture, Christian culture, because there is a difference between uh, a Christian culture or Christian society and, and a Christian church and Christian values or uh, Christian Bible beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of a difference uh, in between these uh, sections. But today we are living in a society where everybody is obsessed to buy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we, we, we're talking about uh, the, the time when we have to sell. Mm -hmm. Well, some of us have something to sell, some not. However, the idea of uh, buying or purchasing today, mm -hmm. uh, especially amongst us with this crisis, everybody wants to go to the mountains. Everybody wants to go to, and, and it's a legitimate move to get out of the cities. So uh, the preoccupation of our members is to find a land, a piece of land where they can do agriculture mm -hmm. and go away from the, 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 the fury of the mob and the crowd and seeing the, 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 the penalty that already the Lord is displaying on the, uh, uh, the big cities of, 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 of the world, uh, which are the citadels of immorality. You know, we do have this obsession of going out of the city and buying a property that will last for a while. Mm -hmm. So how can we reconcile the desire of the Lord 
for the people of God to get out of the cities. And I don't want to extrapolate the subject, but it's kind of interesting. It you is. Know? We are into a, a phobia uh, of getting out of the cities because of legitimate reasons. Mm -hmm. It's because of the advice of the Lord. But at the same time, we have this obsession to buy something and we see that the market is no inventory. You right. know? Exactly. Can you I know? say something? Yes, please, please. You know, I, was, I just was reminded of, of, of some quotes that I was reading recently. Like you say, we're obsessed wanting to get a country, property, and land, and all of this. And I read an interesting observation. She says, you don't need 100 acres. Correct. She says, you need 20. And God will bless your 20 to produce as much as 100. Wonderful. It's like, why do we need these enormous amounts of pieces of land? Because she says, the more you have, the or the many properties, work. the more you're going to have to work, the more you're going to have to get rid of later on. Yes. It's going to be a burden. And here it says it's going to be like a mountain to crush us. Yes. You know, and, and, and it's also maintaining all this. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful mm -hmm. that in the hurry and the flurry of wanting the properties that God wants us to get, we don't overdo it. And we don't get too much more than we can handle. Yes. You know? Yeah. You know, there's another factor in this. I have looked statistically before about where the people of God are in the, according to the statistics of the, um, those that profess the third angel's message. And I found an interesting observation. They were in two places, either in the big cities, you know, appreciating the things that can be benefited from of the world there, or they were in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. where there's no people. Mm -hmm. And so the I thought, yeah. yeah, that's what it was. It was two extremes. And then the things in the middle where you could still earn a living, Witness. yet you still could help people in a practical way because there would at least be some people. Yes. That seemed to be strangely absent. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we can sometimes worry too much, like you used the word obsessed, mm -hmm. We can obsess over this, and that's for my protection, for my well-being, and then forget what we're really here for. We're mm -hmm. really here for others, mm -hmm. to, to somehow take the message to others. And if we're so far removed from everybody, yeah. you know, we forget that heaven is not earth, and mm -hmm. earth is not heaven. Our mm -hmm. kingdom is not of this world. So there's the balance that we have to do, and that's why it only has to be God, the one leading it, because different people, sincere people, might not necessarily be in that, both in that same place, in that same situation. There will be some people that will really be missionary minded and they may have to suffer mm -hmm. in some things. And there'll be some people that have the ideal situation and lose their faith. How can we reconcile these uh, two concepts Buying a property can be oftentimes motivated by the statement in Job, skin by for skin. Man <laughs> gives everything for his life. So buying a property to save my skin or buying a property because I am obeying the word of God that tells me get out of the sea. Yeah. How can we distinguish between two actions, the same target going out of the city, but with two perceptions, two reasons, mm -hmm. obey or fear factor protecting my life. I think that's why we have to, as the, as the note and the lesson brought out, cut loose yeah. from every encumbrance, mm -hmm. that which holds you back. Yes. In other words, keeps you in the world. But that which is of God, like you say, obeying God by faith, yeah. He will pave the way. So, he will make the opportunity. Absolutely. He will guide. And it will be to his glory the whole time. It won't be that I was so smart yeah. and so clever and figured out how to do this. No, it's none of that. So it's going to be God that does it. Every move that the people of God will do, will do not because of fear factor, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. It will be that they are guided mm -hmm. and they follow simply like children the Word of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think that this is the real motivation for us in a sense of uh, listening to the Lord and if we do have this connection with Jesus, I do really believe that uh, he will guide us and give us the warning time when is to sell, when is to buy and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go uh, to the next uh, subsection of the lesson Monday, pursuing the spiritual battle, 
why can we be inspired by seeing how the Holy Spirit works in Jerusalem or worked in Jerusalem in the days of the early church, Acts 5, 12, 16? So how, how are we impressed by the, that display of power? The apostles were doing signs and wonders. Mm -hmm. And they were doing these things because they were so full of the Holy Spirit and they were all of one accord. They were in harmony with one another and people would bring forth the sick and they were doing a lot of the same work that Jesus did. And I like this verse 13. And it said, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. So durst, I looked up that word durst, mm -hmm. and that means they didn't dare mm -hmm. join this church. Because remember, this is just two verses down from Ananias and Sapphira. And so people realized this church was for real. Mm -hmm. It was the real thing. <clears throat> and so in order to be part of that church, they could see the Spirit of God moving and the people in harmony and wonderful things happening for the glory of God. And nobody dared want to be part of such a thing unless they were of the same, same mindset yeah, and the yeah. same desire. So that's very interesting. So, uh, Sister Lily, could someone contest the miracles that have been made by the disciples? Is there where? Was there at least one instance where people say, well, this is not the, the power of God, this is the opposite power and this and that, or it was so amazing and sh shocking for, for even for the elite of that society, they could not dare to open their mouth against the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the power was so great that it says as they brought the sick people into the streets, mm -hmm. just the shadow of, of Peter would overshadow them and they would be healed it seems like Amazing. so it was very powerful what impressed me about their work here we see that the work was not only the preaching of the gospel mm -hmm. it was the whole ministry was to make man whole physically mentally and spiritually they had a health ministry they had a welfare ministry for the poor and for the needy and they even had a demon getting rid of demon ministry yeah. or, or so, a sorcery yes and unclean spirits because in those days people a lot of people had those evil yeah. spirits from yeah. the different backgrounds they came from and they even said they had a counseling ministry they were encouraging the sorrowing the bereaved comforting them uh, counseling mm -hmm. the inexperienced yeah. so that points us to what we should be doing you know, we're not going to win people only by preaching. As a matter of fact, most of our work should be meeting their needs through health, through welfare, through counseling, because there are a lot of hurting people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, those ministries, in addition to three Ps, or the secret of their power, the secret of their success was the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, and the power of the love of God. Mm -hmm. And it says this work will not, cannot be without fruit. Yeah. So that gave them the power, these three powers and the varied ministry. And of course, Jesus Christ was the center of all these ministries. They were all lifting up the man of Calvary, whether yes, it was yes, health yes, or yes. welfare, or whether it was demon uh, possession, looking to Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. So Jesus was, at the end of the day, the main subject of their preaching, correct? Yes. Because yeah. uh, oftentimes it uh, looks like uh, people get bored of Jesus. They get bored of, it, of, it, of Jesus and sometimes people say, I'm sick and tired of hearing guys, only Jesus and Jesus. We need something else, more heavy meat and stuff. But uh, you see, if we like or not, but that the Lord Jesus Christ is the essence of every kind of reform, you know. Yeah. And if we don't have centered this uh, reform in Jesus, we will display pretty aggressive, pretty nasty face and stuff. And uh, our spirit will be pretty bitter and, and aggressive. And even though uh, we start to shake the chicks and turn red, and but that is not from the spirit of the Lord. And uh, I do believe that um, in all this work they have done, preaching the right doctrines. And don't forget, uh, brothers and sisters and uh, uh, dear friends that are watching, you know, the preaching of, of the gospel in the time of Jesus Christ 
was not a, a, a message that was delivered to an idolater uh, uh, nation. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. like, like they didn't worship uh, statues or icons, yeah. they were Jews. You, you, you have the gospel preached in Jerusalem. So they didn't have statues or icons, but they had living statues they were worshiping. The rabbis, the priests, yeah. they, were, they were living statues. Mm -hmm. they, they were moving, yeah. walking statues, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, I think that the message of the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus per se was on the lips of everyone. Yes. And that, that's the most beautiful, extraordinary experience because this is what they left. And this is, this is what terrified the people on, on, on those days. And this is what will terrify the world today, Jesus. Yes. yes. So the, the Jesus we're to present and that they presented was a practical Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. A Jesus who heals, a Jesus who sets free from your problems, who has solutions. It's not only a theological, theoretical Jesus. So, so when, we, when we talk about the power of persuasion, what is persuasion? It's determination. You know, I'm determined. Die or be alive, I want to follow the Lord. So yeah. that is persuasion, to be determined. And then the power of prayer, oh, that, that, that's connection. What is religion? It's come from the Latin term re-elegare, meaning the recovery uh, or, or the healing of the relationship between man and God. That is, by translation, the word religion. It's healing the relationship between you and God. Wow. So when you, you, when you talk about prayer, you talk about healing the relationship between you and God, correct? And then when you talk about a power of love, that, that is a, a character in action, meaning love is the character of God that changes and converts and changes the society, and changes the hearts, changes the minds, changing, changing the, the thinking of humanity and even the destiny of, 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 of Christianity. Don't forget, Jesus was the poorest man in the world and yet he gave the, the most amount of gifts to humanity. He never been to school and yet he proved the highest intellectual level of teachings ever recorded in the history. And I'm sorry for Google for not being honest enough to deliver as Google is interested in Mahatma Gandhi, uh, uh, Tutankhamun, uh, who is uh, Mitra, and all these fancy <laughs> Mohammed and all the Buddha and so on and so forth. Uh, Google should be honest enough to present about Jesus too. But when you talk about Jesus with Buddha, he says, I don't understand the question. Who is Jesus? I don't understand the question. Mm -hmm. Really, you don't <laughs> understand the question or you are not set for that uh, yeah. uh, to answer. So, so when, you, when you talk about this, you realize that God is in, in, in the full strength presenting uh, the, the things that Jesus have done. He never had a, a, a power or change or had army. And yet, he, he produced the most extraordinary political and, and, and military and social and religious changes in the history of the world. So the name Jesus that is absent from Google, Alexa, or Siri is the name that changed the history and changed the future of humanity because it's Jesus. Now, when we go a little bit farther in whom did the enemy of souls stare to fear the jealousy for personal interest to stop the work. And how does this occur today? Acts 5, 17, 18. So what's happened? It's, it's, a, it's a game for influence. Why is influence so addictive? I mean, even in the present time, you see people from all spectrums in society, politics, religion, that they are so greedy for this influence. Is influence something that can equalize power? I, I think so. Huh? Well, that's... um. That's actually what the issue was about in heaven. Lucifer mm -hmm. complained about that. He wanted to be thought of as more important than, than Christ. Yeah. And uh, there's these three temptations that we have, appetite, love of the world, and presumption. And this love of the world is that love of display, love of preeminence. And the high priest, you can imagine how he probably felt when he saw all this happening, mm -hmm. because this was possibly job security, this was possibly other things that he had a whole following, so to speak, as you mentioned a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Some of the people just really kind of bowed down to whatever these so, people so, said. So Christianity was even a national threat. 
yes for right. for for yes. for for uh, for this uh, perspective from this perspective like the 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 high priest will say well if we let them the romans will come and take the country yeah and they were also afraid because deep down their conscience was bothering them mm -hmm. because they were guilty of the blood of Christ. There's no mm -hmm. question about it. Yes, it's true. The Romans technically did the deed, but that combination of church and state is what did mm -hmm. it because that was mm -hmm. incentivated yeah. by the, or incited, as you, if that would be a better word, um, by, the, by the leaders, the religious leaders. Crucify him, crucify him. They got the ball rolling, yeah. and then the Romans did the deed. So here... Their conscience is bothering them, yeah. you know? So it's interesting because we talk about influence and the priests and everything and how they try to react to this. When you look to the church, Christ is on the cross. Church exercises its influence to crucify Christ and to, sh uh, to force Pilate, which is the state representative, mm -hmm. to take that decision. We as a church cannot crucify him because of various reasons by the way, tomorrow we go to Holy Communion to kissy kissy each other and stuff like that, but we have criminal thoughts in our mind, correct? And then Jesus said to Judas, Judas, mm -hmm. betrayest thou the, man of, the Son of Man with a kiss? With I mean, a kiss, yes, exactly. We don't know Jesus. what's in the heart. Yeah. And if, if this good things are not in the heart, there's a problem. So my question is, who was stronger? Because we saw that the state didn't want to crucify Christ. They didn't find anything wrong with him. Pilate, looking at it objectively, which is the state, the yeah. Roman authority, yes. was extremely hesitant to to crucify Christ. Yet, the power and the influence of the church was more powerful than the the influence of the state. So, when you look to the fight between the influence of the church and the influence of the Roman state, at the end, the influence of the Roman uh, the influence of the church has prevailed and made the Roman state to commit a crime, which was unforgivable, under the pressure of Judeo National Church, correct? Yeah. So in the last days, when the people of God will be persecuted, because brothers and sisters, and uh, ladies and gentlemen and friends, you have to understand that these Bibles have a, a meaning and application for our days. When the church and state will collide to dispute the existence of the people of God, at the end of the day, they will, de they will decide if they have to crucify or expel or differentize or wipe away the, the names of Christians in this world very soon. So like in the time of Jesus, the church on earth will exercise a more powerful influence upon the state and the governments will obey the church's decisions to erect and uh, eradicate the people of God like a scapegoat from planet Earth. So th th we, we learn this for a purpose, correct? Yes, exactly. We learn this, not because it, we, 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 we are so much in love with what happened 2,000 years ago. We learn this because we are in a full speed repetition of the same scenario yeah. with the people of God, with the remnant of God in the last days. And uh, we hope that the Lord will give us wisdom and, uh, uh, and uh, serenity of our mind to decide. So uh, at the end of the day, what did they do? The priests, what did they do? What did they try to do to counteract their influence in Acts 5, 17 and 18? They put them in the common prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, they laid hands on them, put them in the common prison. So <laughs> as if that would make a difference. But they weren't going to deal with it quite yet. But they were going to but, definitely but, get them out of the picture for a while here. But uh, they did that before and it didn't work. Correct? And now they try to persuade the same pressure and persecution, thinking that they may... Uh, by intensifying the opposition, they may have a different result on the side of the disciples, but it didn't work that way, yes? Yeah. Now, when we go to Tuesday, because we're a little bit late, a divine intervention in action, in action. When the apostles were in prison for doing God's work, how did the Lord intervene? And uh, what uh, can we learn from this Acts 5, 19, and 20? What happened with the prison? Sister Lily, what well, do you think? Well, the angel of the Lord came by night. He opened the doors and set them free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the Lord said, go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So do the exact opposite. Don't be afraid. Go with boldness and speak. 
uh, yeah, in the temple, and that's exactly what they did. So when they saw them in the temple, they thought that it's a ghost. Huh? I mean, I, we we know that guy is in the cell. How come he's free, preaching with the same boldness? In in is somebody is betraying amongst us, or you know, because yeah. you can accuse everyone for such a conspiracy. Somebody opened uh, the doors of prison. In any circumstance, they will not accept that the angel of the Lord will open the doors of prison. That will be conspiracy theory, correct? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but 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 it's, it, it, it's a factual. It's a factual situation, you know, in a sense. So. Well, they sent, um, you know, someone to bring them from the prison, and they weren't there. The guards were there. The prison was shut but no one was inside. So the Lord had done a great job through his angel. So what was the narratives? Uh, what was the rhetoric that was put in the New York Times at that time? You know, <laughs> did they say the truth or they tried to lie as uh, a, in the same like manner with the resurrection of Jesus? Oh, the disciples have stolen him. Yeah. You know, always you have this media, mm -hmm. a fake media that is lying and giving a false report to population. And, and it's interesting enough, uh, uh, coming back to that point, that the, the, uh, the biblical report says that even today, amongst the Jews uh, circulates this idea that the disciples have stolen his body and, you know, they try yeah, to right. present his resurrection. In reality, Jesus was an imposter for them. Even today, because of a lying report uh, that has been given to the media at that time, which was official, because you have the Judeo church and then even Pilate, yeah. you know, uh, somehow accepted these lying reports to be distributed amongst the people. The Roman soldiers have been paid, you know, tell, tell them that Jesus died of COVID when he didn't die of COVID, correct? He died of crucifixion, you know, of, of, in a, in, if you want to go farther, he didn't die even of crucifixion, he died of a broken heart. heart exactly. this, is, this is what happened. So it is a fantastic analogy yeah. with what happened 2,000 years ago with the Lord and his followers and what's going on today in the present society. We, we have so much corruption. We have so much uh, lack of sincerity, sincerity and transparency. And the same lying reports, the same counteracting uh, uh, forces against the influence of Christianity is, is going against those. And at the end of the day, we will be the scapegoat. You are guilty for global warming. You are gu guilty for climate change. When we had a fire in California, they said, well, those who don't believe in uh, global warming are guilty. Now, when you had the freezing stuff in Texas, there is no global warming. And then you change the chemistry and you say, oh, in fact, it's not the global warming, it's the climate change. So tell me, it's a global warming or it's a climate change? But you see how they twist the things just to make sure the narratives they put out there is believed, is credible. And because they did not receive the love of the truth. Yeah. Most of the people will believe a heresy, a lie. Yeah, Basically. and then they start this intimidation tactic here in the, in the, in the, in the Bible here, mm -hmm. mentions here, the high priest came and then that were with him mm -hmm. and called the council together and mm -hmm. all the Senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So they're ready to do some intimidation tactics mm -hmm. there and they're gonna, mm -hmm. you know, basically try to intimidate them. They're brought before to speak mm -hmm. for themselves, mm -hmm. to answer for themselves, mm -hmm. as if they've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. They haven't done anything wrong. That's what's amazing. Yeah. And it's this, you know, like you say, guilty until proven innocent kind of attitude, which mm -hmm. is totally, yeah. it's totally yeah. not the way it should be. And so basically they, they knew that they had a message to share. Correct. And it was by guidance of the Lord. And how many of us today, and I ask myself this question, knowing you, you, you just got thrown in prison for something the day before, mm -hmm. for talking about Jesus, yeah. Would you then be ready to go ahead and do it the next day? Yeah. And let them go ahead and keep throwing you in prison every day if they have to do it. I think that their enthusiasm was increasing. Yes, it That's was. it is. They they were and and they were so thankful. And and the, the lesson brought out also about when religious liberty will be increasingly curtailed mm -hmm. and the and it starts getting tighter and harder for the for the present truth to be presented to the world that doesn't like it. And it mentions that we can't sit calmly back saying, okay, this is prophesied and I'll just watch and watch, watch the and movie. Yeah. yeah, and have some popcorn. No, 
it says we're not doing the will of God if we sit in quietude doing nothing to preserve liberty of conscience. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that we're supposed to go out and be activists? It doesn't so, say that. It so, says yeah, go ahead. It says fervent, effectual prayer should be ascending to heaven that this calamity may be deferred until we can accomplish the work which has been so long neglected, which is the work of presenting the truth before mm -hmm. the world yeah. mm -hmm. with so, the spirit of Christ. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, interestingly enough that uh, the claim is there that there will be a power in the book of Revelation chapter 18 that will be a great work that will reveal the character of Christ. And I, I would love to be part of that movement. Mm -hmm. I would love yes. to be part of that, that uh, action mm -hmm. that is so united in Christ through the, the, the channel that is called the remnant of God. But how can we reconcile the fear the Christians display today with the professed claim that we might be part of that Revelation 18 phenomena? Because for me, it's very hard to reconcile the fear the, the type of underdog mentality we display today in the time of crisis when neutrality in the time of crisis is a crime. It yeah. is a crime, yes. So, and in the same time, I claim to be covering the world with the glory of Jesus Christ, which is in my character. I mean, I, I, I have a hard time to reconcile these two elements in the picture. If you see, and then that, that there is a problem. The more we claim, the less we are. Mm -hmm. The less we claim, the more we are. That's right. It's a principle. It's a moral mm -hmm. principle. So we should stop creating labels and fancy, uh, you know, uh, titles for ourselves. Titles for yeah. ourselves, and try to focus on our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ right. to give the, us that change of character that will make the uh, the difference in the world, and we turn the world upside down. Mm -hmm. But at this the present time, I see a, a people of God disoriented and hesitant in taking a stand and speaking openly about the revelation of Jesus Christ. If we want to be Revelation 18, we have to speak about the revelation of God's and Christ's character. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Now, going to Wednesday, uh, rendering supreme obedience, what are we to turn uh, from Peter in the face of uh, opposition? Acts 5, 27, 29. So what happened with Peter? Again, Peter, the P Peter that was so afraid, Peter that was so, uh, you know, running away from uh, any kind of dialogue with a, a dialogue with that lady. Now, again, is Peter confronting them? What happens? It's very interesting. You know, they're talking to Peter and the other disciple like they're children. They said, didn't we tell you or command you that you should not <laughs> yeah. teach in his name? Mm -hmm. And behold, you have filled all Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So they're telling them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they said, you want to accuse us of being the ones who killed him. But Peter said, uh, we ought to obey God rather than men. And then he talks about the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Mm -hmm. Him has God exalted to the right hand to be a prince and a savior and to give forgiveness of sins. So Peter is very bold. He's not afraid to tell them you're the guilty ones mm -hmm. who killed him. And he's right now at the throne of God on his right hand interceding and giving repentance. Absolutely no fear full confidence and I think in one of the other lessons he talked there they were glad to suffer for Jesus mm -hmm. they were not mm -hmm. afraid mm -hmm. you know oh, what what will they do to me if I say this no I have to say what I have to say and what a privilege it is to be persecuted for him so it's interesting uh, the question yeah. is and I have for the, the the people that are watching online could Peter or the disciples promote the gospel and have in mind the same uh, element that is called political correctness. So let us preach the gospel, but don't attack the authorities, mm -hmm. the priests that are guilty for the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Could they have managed to deliver a sugared gospel hmm. 
you know, in a way that I don't bother the Romans, I don't bother the Jews. I'm just, uh, you know, so swallow, uh, so so uh, uh, suave, yeah. easy to go in yeah. between, and I don't bother anybody. And hey, guys, if you like to have Jesus amongst you, okay. But uh, look, you can be with the priests, you can be with the Romans, but you can be with Jesus too. So <clears throat> basically. According with uh, what Sister Lily said, that uh, the, 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 the priests were very bothered because uh, Peter was preaching a gospel that didn't have anything to do with the political correctness and the, the principles of ethics. They were upset that the guilt was resurrected in every single sermon. Mm -hmm. uh, that they are guilty, mm -hmm. this is what they did. And on the other side, they said, look, this is a conspiracy theory. We didn't kill mm -hmm. Jesus. Jesus was a usurper and this and that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's such a, such a phenomenal uh, par parallel in between today's society and that type of society. So this type of message, it's a message that uh, will, uh, will uh, show that the people of God fear God, mm -hmm. not men. Mm -hmm. Because there is, it's better to be with God and be judged by the world mm -hmm. rather to be with the world and be judged by God. Because at the end of the day, this will happen. The world will be polarized, you know, split in two. Those that are with God being judged by the world, by the majority, and those who are with, um, with the world and will receive the seven plagues and will be judged by God. So mm -hmm. I do believe that amongst these two options, we better be with the Lord and be judged. Mm -hmm. Whatever nicknames they want to yeah. give us, it, you know, to, to, to stand for, for, for the truth. It's, it's, it's important for us to, to get that. Brother Livio, I just wanted to mention that this type of boldness mm -hmm. came through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It couldn't Absolutely. have happened before, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit was outpoured. And, you know, they were totally converted and they had to say what the Holy Spirit was speaking with such power. They can't keep mm -hmm. silent. They mm -hmm. couldn't keep silent. Yeah. And this is so important. And I really like that point that you brought out a couple of minutes ago that they were talking to them like they were children. Mm -hmm. the, the priests and rulers were, were treating them like children. Mm -hmm. Were they children? No, they were grown men. There's no reason to be con condescending to adults. Mm -hmm. There's no reason that we have to talk to adults as if they're children. And if anybody does that to us, it's they're, tr they're trying to throw around their authority and exalt themselves if they talk in such a condescending way. And so they basically, again, they felt guilty about the thing about Jesus. And as mentioned, Peter spoke in a way that wasn't necessarily politically correct, but he wasn't really trying to... Um, incriminate them in a bad way. He wanted to focus on the thing itself because it says, okay, this is Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted to give repentance. In other words, you can have repentance. I mean, he's already making an invitation right mm -hmm. now in a positive way. It says, we're his witnesses. And so also, I like this verse, so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. Mm -hmm. There's the key. Mm -hmm. If people say they want the Holy Ghost today mm -hmm. and they want this power, mm -hmm. unless they're going to obey God. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, by wanting that power, they're already breaking the commandment about coveting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have that desire to follow God and obey him. And when we have that, the Holy Spirit is able to use us as his instruments, instead of us trying to manipulate the situation, condescend over other people, or have some kind of, you know, dubious power. And the lesson we'll bring out later more about when that was done erroneously by people with the wrong motives. And we've mm -hmm. already just finished talking about earlier from last week mm -hmm. about people that had wrong motives yeah. and wanted power. It's not about power. The power is God. Mm -hmm. And we have the privilege to be part of the picture. Yeah. That is a wonderful thing. We get to have the, the privilege as we submit to God. Yeah, so do you remember Simon the Magician? Yeah, exactly. Meeting with Simon the Peter. Yes. Give me that power. I give you gold and silver mm -hmm. for that power. But uh, power, you see, power means God, as you said. So we cannot make God subject of our personal interest. And mm -hmm. that's why I think that today it's a lot of business uh, around this uh, discussion. Uh, do, did you receive the power? of the Holy Spirit, did you get the power? Uh, I think, I think uh, we are subjects of the influence of the Holy Spirit. 
not the Holy Spirit is subject of my influence. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's a, big, a big difference. Now, moving farther uh, to come uh, towards uh, a conclusion uh, of our study today, divine leading. Uh, how did the Lord use the wisdom of the matter uh, of a mature uh, ther um, Pharisee to reason with the council in their fury against Christians? Acts 50, uh, 5, uh, 33, 39. And why can we uh, be truly uh, inspired by the result, verse 40 and 42. So what, what, what is the, uh, the, the climax of this conflict at the end of the day? Well, this is a, this is a calm man of reason. Mm -hmm. And when you have the council that was ready to be like a pack of dogs, mm -hmm. you know, I think we've all seen a time when you have a, a dog that's a perfectly nice dog, mm -hmm. and you have another dog that's a perfectly nice dog. And sometimes when they get around and they get in a pack, and you'll see those dogs behave Changing. in a way that you have never. Yeah. And then you try to reason with the dog, a normally obedient dog, and you can't reason with the dog anymore. Mm -hmm. You call the dog, you just pour water in their face. You can't do anything to stop mm -hmm. You know what starts happening when they get in a pack. Yeah. And it's because this alpha took over, and then that alpha then uh, forgets about the alpha of people, and then starts this, and this council was, was starting to do that. They were mm -hmm. getting rolled up, you know, riled up or whatever the word is. And this mature, calm Pharisee and says, look, remember some other cases that mm -hmm. were like this. It wasn't of God, it amounted to nothing. He said, but if this is of God, you cannot be careful, don't be on the wrong <laughs> side of the picture. Yes. So just, and so by that, the Holy Spirit was able to use this, this individual to reason with them, calm them down, and, but then of course they have to beat them first. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll just beat them and let them go like they did with Jesus. They're <laughs> scourging and then they yes. let them go. Yes. Okay, is that fair? No, it's not fair. But how did they respond? They, were, they rejoiced that mm -hmm. they were accounted worthy to suffer for Christ. Would we have this attitude? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the way people are when they're fully under this, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. They're pleased to suffer for Christ because yeah. There's nothing greater than yeah. to be following in his will. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. I mean, I think that Gamaliel is yeah. a, yeah. Gamaliel. It's a, it's a name. I don't believe that accidentally the Bible records his, his name. His name, exactly. Uh, honestly, uh, beyond the psychomaniac type of behavior that the Pharisees had, you see the integrity of this Pharisee which shows that amongst them were still thinkers mm -hmm. and people who later on received the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The fact that he was not impressed by their insane behavior. Do you remember yeah. when, 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 when uh, they got together the similar people to stone Stephen? Yes. Yeah, same thing. They same throw thing, yes. dust in heaven and scream and yes. do funny things. And they were so righteous, yeah, they yeah, thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Take away a yes. man like this from the face of the earth. Yeah. I mean, and, and they have the same spirit today yeah, in yeah. behalf of their self-righteousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have people self-righteous today. Oh, a people that will always behave like this. Always that people that are self-intoxicated, self-righteous, they will feel justified to hate, to change their color, the color of their faces, to scream at you, to accuse you, to, to shake, and to, to be full of anger in behalf of a holy uh, justification mm -hmm. and the Pharisees were the same but yeah. Gamaliel was mm -hmm. led by a different spirit yes which was calm yeah mm -hmm. condescent uh, being uh, condescending the the, the, the the mature thinking mm -hmm. he was not emotional yeah. that's right he was not uh, hijacked by by losing control or stepping over the board of the coral correct mm -hmm. he was Gamaliel was really speaking uh, through the Holy Spirit, I, I do believe that God gave them one of the last resorts mm -hmm. he had in that council, mm -hmm. using Gamaliel as a voice, mm -hmm. one of theirs. Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe he can exercise better influence right. to repent and convert. I mean, how much love God has mm -hmm. for these people. We yeah. may have tendency to hate them. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. But um, you see, God did not hate these people. No. Mm -hmm. God went an extra mile. Yes. Mm -hmm to save even those evil 
priests, Pharisees, whatever, with their intrigue and their bitterness and evilness and whatever. The Lord wanted to save them and made final appeals uh, over and over again. As soon as God will find someone that will be uh, receptive to the influence of the Holy Spirit, will use that man to preach the gospel to them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, and, 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 and the, 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 logistic, the, logic, the uh, logical explanation Gamaliel gave show a spiritual maturity. If right. they are not from God, they will disappear. But if this work comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and our Elohim, God is with us, uh, you cannot stop them, guys. So be careful not to face yourself surprised at the end that you are fighting God. I mean, it was a decent, elegant, intellectual, super uh, refined appeal to their hearts. Did and they he, listen to them, to him? <laughs> really. But what's interesting is that he didn't. He wasn't professing to be a Christian. He wasn't. No, he didn't no, immediately jump no. out of the council and, and move yeah. over to the yeah. to the disciples. But you see, the Holy Spirit was with him. Yes. Yeah. And like you say, in a way, he was witnessing to them. Yeah. Without even having been converted yeah. per se yet yeah. at that point. Maybe we will not even baptize Gamaliel in our church today because, <laughs> you know, we, we may have a second thought if he's okay. But you see, this Aravid just says that there out there in the world are people that never been exposed to the law of God. Yeah, that's right. To the Christian yeah. teachings. Yeah. And yet they do by nature the things of the law. And by these, they will be recognized as sons and daughters of God. That's right, it's especially in heathen lands. Yeah. In yeah. heathen lands, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So uh, once again, back mm -hmm. to propaganda versus to be or to do. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, the more we claim, the less we are. The less we claim, the more we are. And Ellen G. White says, what you are, cries louder in my heart, in my mind, than what you say. So it doesn't matter what you say, it matters what I do to impress the world. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I hope that, I thank you very so much. A final comment, Sister Lily, and uh, if we want to rip up the... Uh... Just a few lines yes, from the please. note, which speaks about how Christ views us when mm -hmm. we're being persecuted. Yeah. It says here, Never is the tempest tried soul more dearly loved by his Savior than when he's suffering reproach for the truth's sakes. Mm -hmm. I will love him, Christ says, and will manifest myself to him. When for the truth's sake the believer stands at the bar of earthly tribunals, Christ stands by his side. Mm -hmm. What a comforting yeah, thought. Yeah. If we can always remember that. I'm not alone. Christ comes down, stands next to me. When we're confined in prison walls, Christ manifests himself to him and cheers his heart with his love. When he suffers death for Christ's sake, the Savior says to him, they may kill the body, but they cannot hurt the soul. Be of good cheer. Mm -hmm. So like he was in the den of lions and like he was in the fiery furnace and in prison anywhere, he will be with us. We have no fear except the fear that we do not surrender today, mm -hmm. yeah. this moment. Mm -hmm. There's cool. one last thing I thought was, was in the note too. It says the disciples were humble men, not, hu not full of pride, as you mm -hmm. were saying, and without wealth and with no weapon but the Word of God. Mm -hmm. That was the only weapon they had, was yes. the Word of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the Lord's presence was with them. They didn't need a weapon because they had the presence of God with yeah. him, and he's going to, want, going to be the one to take care of everything. Amen. Praise the Lord. I thank you very much, uh, uh, sisters, for this cooperation for the Sabbath School. I thank you very much uh, to all of you that were online watching with us and bear with our infirmities. But I hope by God's grace, we try to dissect the Word of God in such a manner to be beneficial uh, or um, an advantage for us uh, to grow in the grace of God and to learn to be strong where yesterday we were weak. So that is the privilege of learning from the Word of God every Sabbath. So we thank you so very much for being with us and uh, we wish you all the best and happy Sabbath. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so very much for giving us a chance to study thy Word. And we thank you, Lord, for touching our hearts and our minds and showing us elements of character that have to be changed you are so dear to our heart because you are so loving. Yes. A Heavenly Father that is never tired of forgiving and loving uh, people with infirmities and limitations like us. 
In the name of Jesus, we thank you for all the brothers and sisters, friends, and everybody that is uh, online watching and studying the Sabbath school, the Word of God with us. Lord, bless every one of them. And if there are people that are kneeling down with us today uh, in their homes and they are crying, you are the master that can wipe the, weep, the tears from our, uh, our cheeks and uh, give us a sense of uh, uh, security for the future. In the name of Jesus, we ask you evidently forgiveness for our sins and we hope that you will bless us now and ever. Amen. 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 We want to thank you for joining us in the study of the book of Acts this Sabbath, and we look forward to seeing you next Sabbath morning.